Hello, all of you wonderful Artera wine drinkers. Welcome to the 2020 spring release presented to you virtually by owner and winemaker Jason Murray and special guest Dan Redding with My Novo Wine Blog. Um, today we will be presenting the 2019 Chenin Blanc, the 2019 Roussan, 2018 Chardonnay, 2019 Rosé, 2019 Hawk Moth Reserve. All delightful and amazing, which you will find out shortly. Uh, a couple of things before the tasting gets started. Uh, we are offering a half bottle preserver to go along with all of our tasting experiences. This is a great way for you to open multiple bottles of wine and not feel like you have to drink them all. Um, you might be hurting if you did that for the, all of these. These are free for you and you can order them online with the spring release set. Um, please watch the video though on how to use it to make sure that you are preserving your wines correctly. It is on our YouTube, um, our Terra Wines page, and we will send you a card with that link as well. Um, please also join our Facebook tasting group so that you can comment on your experience with our new white release. Uh, we'd love to hear, hear comments, feedback, questions for Jason or any of the above. So again, that's on Facebook. Join the Artera Wines uh, tasting group. And just a little side note, the 2019 Roussan is, uh, was lower yield and Jason will go into that during the tasting experience, but please note that there are only 22 cases of the 2019 Roussan available. And that's all. Hope you enjoy the tasting. Thanks so much. All right, welcome. Uh, we are about to do the 2019 whites and 2018 rosé. Uh, vintage release for the springtime starts with club and moves on to everybody. And it's going to be a pretty exciting time because I think we're all ready for something fresh, new, and different uh, to enjoy right now. So I have a special guest today, Dan Redding. He is my Nova wine blog. You can find it on pretty much all the platforms and um, good buddy, good supporter of ours. So we're real excited to have him here and he's gonna chime in along the way to help keep me straight and on track. So say hi, Dan. Hi everyone. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So, all right, uh, we are going to go through uh, the wines one at a time and then maybe some back and forth on things. Uh, so we have Chenin Blanc, Roussan, Chardonnay, Rosé, and a new sweet wine that we have called Hawk Moth. It's a Petit Mensang based blend. So here we go. All right, so I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of the vintage year. We're principally looking at 2019s here. Uh, 2019 was a very dry year from say mid-June on through the end of harvest. We got just a little bit of rain uh, in August when we needed it to keep vines going, but it was dry. In some ways you would think of it as an ideal vintage. We got good rain for spring growth, dried out, great concentration in the fruit, but it all kind of depends. Everything is um, influences on styles and characters in the wine. So what we have found as a general theme with the 2019s is more of this concentrated, bold, full, rich feel to the wines. Maybe a little bit less of the delicate, floral, elegant, brighter sides of some of the wines. Really interesting, especially if you look at some of the differences over vintage years. I think Dan's definitely going to pick up on this because I know he really likes the Chenin Blanc and I perceive some difference in this. Not good or bad, different. Uh, so it'll be fun to also see once we hit the 2018 Chardonnay because our Chardonnays always come out a year later after they get longer barrel age and longer bottling age which fills out their rich fuller textural characteristics came from a totally different kind of a season but Chardonnay is actually very consistent for us so year to year we see a lot of uh, similarities in, in the weight character feel flavors of the wine. So it'll be fun to see that one mixed up. So why does the amount of rainfall affect a white? I know with red wines, the rainfall and the moisture makes the, the grapes themselves fuller and plumper and um, tends to dilute the, the characteristics. Where with white wines, where you don't have that same structure necessarily, why is there an impact? Well, it's a good question. and. 
I think there's two factors at play here. One is the moisture, uh, which was what you asked about, which drier is just going to lead towards more concentration being more of a full, dense, richer, stronger character to the wines, and often is going to push towards higher sugars, which would result in a higher final alcohol in wines, and the alcohol plays against the acidity and the imbalance of a wine. So as if you kept conceptually acidity the same, as the alcohol gets higher, the wine is going to taste drier and less bright and tart. So one aspect is going to be the uh, soil moisture rainfall. Another factor that's going to come in is the temperature. And this plays with the moisture regime. But in warmer years, in both reds, and, and I think it translates in whites, in warmer and drier years, there's more bold intensity and in cooler and damper years, it's more like vivid fruit flavor type characteristics come through. And also being warmer and drier in 2019, it actually pushed ripening earlier. Mm -hmm. So it's some of the earliest picking that we've done with a more advanced ripening at that earlier time of picking. So that means we ripened under faster, hotter conditions than we're used to, as opposed to those years where it's cooler and it really stretches out longer. So we had the higher alcohol with a shorter ripening, which in some ways leans more towards what you think of those warm, dry climates like California, Washington, things like that. So stylistically, it shifts a little bit towards a hot, dry climate style of wine. All right, so Dan's in here ready to drink. He's like, you got me to come out, so I get on with it. So, Shannon, please. Shannon, all right, all right. So first what we're gonna do is Shannon Blanc. So Chenin Blanc typically is the first white that we pick. It sometimes struggles with damp conditions during ripening and can have some rot problems and forces us to pick it quicker. 2019, it really didn't have any rot problems and was really advanced in its ripeness and had good yields to it. We changed some things in the vineyard in terms of the pruning and the fruit set that we were looking at. And uh, got up to right now, we have most ever. It's about 75 cases of this wine. Mine is too. So <laughs> we're pretty excited about that. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and try this one. Check it. I love it. I think it's great. I think it definitely has. Do you get that? what I'm talking about, that like fuller, richer, a uh, little bit weightier characteristic, fuller body to it, and that shift a little bit away from that like bright floral, right? Um, but more richness to it. Yeah, I would almost say, whereas the, the previous vintage felt sharper to me, this is very smooth, there's a, there's a softness to it that I really enjoy, you still get that, um, not sure is it apple that I'm getting on it, the, the tang at the beginning, um, but you get that nice fruit characteristic too, but it feels softer to me um, and it's really pleasant. Yeah, I think it's got the zip of the acidity, but it comes a little bit on the back of the palate, whereas up front you get a little bit more of that alcohol and the balance from the way that the ripening you always gives it a drier up front, a little tartar. Mm -hmm. as it goes to the back yeah. as being acid dominated mm -hmm. in the wine. So a little bit of a shift from mm -hmm. previous years, but so much volume, richness, yeah. texture, and body in this wine. Yeah. All right, so moving on, we have next the Roussan. Mm -hmm. So this one's kind of a different story than the uh, Chenin Blanc. So after that wet 2018 year was a little bit of a stress on some vines, this one uh, had a hard time through the winter of Roussan. So we dropped yield on this one. We had been doing around 50 cases a year of Roussan. This one I have available to sell 22. 
that's it. I know. We are a little bit sad about it. But at the same time, I think the ripening season and characteristics for this wine were pretty much ideal and spot on. And so we're going to look at this one as we've always described it as kind of an evolution style wine. So I filled your cup up a little bit extra. <laughs> Uh, this is one that when we first open the bottle and it's a little cooler, you, you sometimes get more of the, the bright, crisp, fresh. And as we let it breathe and warm, it opens up all that broad, rich, complex depth of more advanced uh, flavor characteristics. So we're going to try this one now, and then we're also going to probably come back to it after a little while later in the flight and see if we're picking up any of those differences. This is typically a little bit higher alcohol in the first place compared to the Shannon, typically fuller bodied. Uh, this one is still fermented as we do with all the whites and then neutral oak aged, not to the length that we do the Chardonnay. The Roussan does about five months in the neutral oak barrels and then bottles being from the Rhone, I think longer aging in the cellar it puts on a little bit more risk of oxidation. So I think this lets it develop what it wants to get from being in the barrel and on the lees. We get it safely into the bottle and then let it bottle age at that point is a big advantage. So let's see what we think, Dan. All right, so I get classic in here, that like rich, um, not necessarily like buttery, but butterscotchy yep. kind of feel to it. Whether or not you pick up that flavor, I don't know, but it definitely like feels like a butterscotch candy. I, I always thought uh, with your Roussan that there was almost this hint of honey at the end that I couldn't explain because it wasn't exactly a sweet wine, but I always would finish the sip and then go, hmm, I feel like I, I just had honey um, or left this sense of honey. And this one has less of it actually than I feel than the previous vintages, that, that honey sense, but I actually love this because as you described it, there is that fullness or that volume to it. Um, and it, this is not what I typically get in a white wine. I tend to like high acid white wines that are very sharp and very bright. And this is more of that fullness um, that you described. I, I, this is great. I'll be curious to see, we come back to it after it breathes a little bit, uh, see how it evolves in terms of the characteristics you're talking about, and also as they bottle age, mm -hmm. uh, to see how these characteristics evolve and come out over the course of time. So what, what happened in the vineyard that decreased production this year? Was there weather damage or something happened to the vines? So it seemed to be a response to where it's located in the vineyard going through that wet year of 2018. Uh, this grape Roussan coming from the Rhone comes from a notably drier climate. And there is one portion of uh, the block of the Roussan where it kind of does a saddle shape to it and stayed a little wetter through 2018 season and that creates some more stress on the roots. And if you have stressed roots through the winter time that creates some more winter problems. Mm -hmm. So we had one portion of the vineyard of the Roussan block have some die back, just the vines just died back to shorter trunks. And we basically had to, they didn't die, but we had to regrow the whole infrastructure of the vine. We had other vines where some of the shoots would set fruit and some wouldn't. Hmm. So between these two issues that were both winter damage related, the year 2019 started and then finished way down on yields. Mm. So this was response to moisture stress um, in 2018 and winter damage. What we've done is we just started to transition the pruning and the Roussan to match what is showing as more successful for the Chenin Blanc. It's a change from how I have traditionally done what's called cane pruning through the entire vineyard, which is removing basically all the shoots and infrastructure of the vine except for the trunk and just taking two new shoots in the middle and laying them down every year as a complete renewal of the vine. Mm -hmm. We were seeing problems with the fruit set in the Shinnin, so we changed this first there, that some shoots have fruit and some don't, and we're doing it now in the Roussan uh, to try and increase 
how many shoots we have to pick from to keep ones that have fruit and get rid of ones that don't. So it isn't that we're trying to have more shoots, we're just trying to give the option to end up with a higher proportion of them fruitful. So what we're doing then is what's called cordon trained and spur pruned, which means you basically keep the trunk continuously up and out onto the wire. And the canes that grow off of that each year, instead of removing them, they're cut down to the base of them, what are called spurs, and each spur can grow two shoots mm. out of it. So where we would have normally had four, we can start our season with eight, and we can remove, theoretically, the four that don't have fruit mm. to keep four that do have fruit. So it isn't to increase to get high yields, it's to bring it up to a normal yield. Mm. And it seems to be working really well for the Chenin Blanc, and I think it'll really help with Roussan because it's also kind of borderline with its cold tolerance for the region. So hopefully that step with these two kind of grapes will help us stabilize production. So uh, that's Roussan. We're moving on to Chardonnay. All right, so this is 2018. Uh, so it's a different vintage year than what we're looking at. To repeat, the Chardonnays are aged in the barrel for 10 months and then get at least about six months bottle aged before we release them. So it's a longer program, more similar to what you would think of as how you age and release a red wine, and that develops the bigger volume, rich texture, kind of locks that in with the Chardonnay. Even though there's been some significant differences in vintage years, 17, 18, 19, uh, we've seen a lot of consistency uh, with this grape. This comes from the Seven Oaks site over in Philemont and seems to be a really good site for Chardonnay. So it's been really pleasant to see that this has overcome a lot of the challenges associated with vintage years. So this is younger, came from a cooler, damper season. We're trying it next to these big wines that came from the 2019 season. And let's see how this shows. I'm excited. I just had a 17 last week, so I can really compare. That's what we've been selling in the tasting room right up until now. So now you got a chance to try something new for the first time. All right, we're going to check it out. I get classic Chardonnay flavor. Mm -hmm. Actually, just a little bit of that butter mm -hmm. comes through, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more than some other vintages for us, and that's probably a reflection of that year 2018 being cooler and damper, a lot more malic acid was retained in the grapes at harvest time, and that converts over to that buttery character, so maybe we get just a, a little higher note of that mm -hmm. than in a lot of years. Um, maybe doesn't show the heavy hitter character that the 2019s do, um, but from coming off of a year like that, like I'm really happy with the weight body freshness to it, uh, so that flavor, freshness, um, and texture balance that we get in the Chardonnay still shows up here. I'm pretty happy with it. What do you think? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's really good. I got, I never get butter out of your Chardonnay, um, our Terra Chardonnay. I, I associate butter with grocery store Chardonnay. So. I, I don't tend to like that flavor. I get a slight hint of it in here, but to me, what overpowers or what mitigates that is that very clean feel of this Chardonnay because you really get to the fruit. You're not tasting oak and all these other flavors that, that meet the fruit. Um, it, is, um, it is different from the 19s. It doesn't have the same fullness, but it's it's pleasant. I, I like this. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. And sorry, Dan, I haven't drank a lot of those grocery store Chardonnays. <laughs> no. But I drink our Chardonnay and I like it. <laughs> so one question I have for you is, you know, red wines tend to struggle in that wetter year. How did the Chardonnay do with 2018? How did the grapes and the vines fare in that, that wetter, moister year? Dan, we're focusing on 20, no, I'm kidding, 2019. Um, actually, the whites all did really 
well. We had certain reds that did well. We'll talk about that another time. Um, but we've actually already sold through. Last year's release was the 2018 Chenin Blanc and the 2018 Roussan. And I think you enjoyed that, so we did okay with that. <laughs> and so this is the last one of the 2018 Whites to come out. The 2018 Whites uh, had their challenges, but got through right before things got really tough. So they held on as long as they could. I would say in general, you know, if you had your choice, all the whites might have hung an extra week compared to what we were able to do to bring on maybe a little bit more concentration. But I think considering the way that the year went, um, the whites actually fared extremely well overall. I'm really pleased with them uh, having coming out of 2018 in that wet season, and they did get picked right before the end of September got really tough. Uh, so I think they came in just in the nick of time to make these lovely wines, um, despite the challenges. All right, we're moving on to rosé. It's always kind of a mystery here what goes in the rosé. Two years ago, it was the, the Malbec and Petit Verdot rosé that was one of the best rosés I've ever had. Last year, it was Cab Franc. What's in this one? Uh, it does change every year, and this is in response to the growing season and what we have and what we're thinking, and who knows how many other factors. This one is Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. It is 60% Cab Franc and 40% Cab Sauv. So the Cab Franc comes from the Seven Oaks Vineyard, and I decreased the dry red Cab Franc production in favor of making this, which I might come to regret having done. Uh, and used one of our two blocks here of Cabernet Sauvignon to go into it. And um, it's probably gonna change again next year, yeah. So this one though is fascinating to me because the fruit quality was really good, um, but in a totally different way than the 2018 uh, rosé. The 2018 rosé being that Cab Franc was picked in that wet season and was really like light, fresh, bright fruit characteristics it was good for rosé, it wasn't going to be good for a red wine in 2018. This one might go back a little bit more to the balance or feel of that 17 you're talking about, that was the Malbec and Petit Verdot blend, that I would have described as going more Spanish-styled maybe rosé as opposed to Provence-styled. And uh, this is going to show that like big, full, volume richness of the 2019 vintage, uh, but I think still has that like bright, crisp, fresh, great fruit flavor to it. So I'm gonna try it. I'm pretty excited about this one. I love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, every rosé you've done has been different each year and, and this is amazing. Um, it's definitely so different from last year, probably the influence of the caps off, but also the the change in the fruit quality because of the growing season. It's just such a different uh, grape that's produced. Yeah, it's got a little bit more of that higher sugar in the grapes, higher alcohol in the wine, balancing, if anything, maybe a little bit lower acidity in it. Mm -hmm. Lots of concentrated mm -hmm. fruit flavors yep. come through in this one. And then I guess we should just review our basic concept of how we go about making the rosé here, because it's not the everyday way of making rosé. I pick fruit that I think is well suited uh, and available to us based on the vintage year from our vineyards, and uh, use whole berries. So de-stem and crush the fruit, soak it on the skins for a full day to get this color extracted and those fruit flavors from the skins extracted into the wines and then press the whole berries, the whole fruit, just like you would make a white wine. Mm -hmm. When you press the pulp, you get all that like refreshing, smooth, pleasant, balanced juice. You don't get that bitter, bitey, edgy character that's so common in rosé. And that's because a lot of rosé is made just by pulling juice out of the red fermenters immediately after crushing. And that first juice that releases after crushing isn't the pulp. It's got this smoother character I'm talking about. 
it's this juice that's right underneath the skin. You pop the grape open, skin's loose, juice comes out. It's that a little bit more astringent and phenolic juice. And you get that like bite that I don't like in rosé. <laughs> Maybe other people love it, but not me. Um, so I really like the style that we produce because it's really flavorful, really pleasantly smooth. So Jason, to my knowledge, you've never produced a Cabernet Sauvignon-based wine here at Artera. This is this is different. Where have you been hiding the Cab Sauv? It's a long story. Maybe a rocky road in some ways. <laughs> um, I haven't always believed in Cabernet Sauvignon as a principal grape for Virginia uh, because it's very responsive to water like we're talking about. So wet years, it's like really not good. And really dry, warmer years, it can make some impressive concentrated red wines. A lot of years, it's just kind of nice, but not amazing. And I didn't define it as a great, that to make a great Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Sauvignon based wine in Virginia requires a lot of cellar work. And I'm not a cellar work winemaker. I make my wines based on the natural characteristics that are in the fruit. Uh, so I'm not going to try to fix it, correct it, intensify anything in the cellar. So I did plant a couple acres of it when we started the Artera Vineyard, um, partly because I was scared of too much that was too cold tender, and I went with something that was a little bit safer and more reliable, and was still on the concept when I was starting here of blending with Petit Bordeaux and Cabernet Sauvignon as a spin-off of the classic Bordeaux blend that I had done some blending with Petit Bordeaux as the basis and then Cabernet Sauvignon coming in second, as opposed to the other way around, starting with the Cap Sauv base blend. I've had some success with that in 2014 and 15 when we had a lot of winter damage and low yields on some of our more um, typical varietals for our tariff. I did have some Cabernet Sauvignon from another site out by Winchester in the 14 and the 15 reserve blends. But as soon as we started blending in 2017 for the Seven Oaks and the Crooked Run with our first crops here, everything went in the direction of these southern French blends, whether it's southwestern France or Rhone style. Uh, it was the Tanat, the Petit Bordeaux, with either the Malbec or the Petit Syrah dark, rich reds going away from Bordeaux blending. And that's working for my program based on consistency of quality in Virginia's climate without cellar manipulation. So I've strayed away from it enough and found other things that I need more of that work here to where we're already transitioning some of our caps off plantings. So we have about two thirds of the front acre of Capsaw, we already pulled out and put in more roots on because uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, that remaining third of an acre in the front field is never going to go away because it has beautiful leaves that Sandy uses all the time to make her artwork <laughs> and she can run right out the door and get on. So there's Capsaw there and being that I'm not you know, super excited about it as a red wine, I can choose based on the year, is it going to go on the rosé and it'll be great. Or will it be a small component of blending uh, for a red estate plant? Then my back acre of Cabernet Sauvignon, we picked it in 2019, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But we already actually have plans to replace it, not this spring, but next spring, with Mortonat and Malbec. Half an acre of Malbec to go, and yeah, yeah, exactly because we finally lost all the Malbec at the Seven Oaks site. We're without any Malbec right now. It's really cold tender, so I'm going in with some, but not a lot. Right. Uh, the tricky side of Cabernet Sauvignon, again, is I'm not impressed with it in those wet, cool years. It doesn't concentrate. Whereas the hot, dry years, like 2019, it came in right around 30 bricks, 30% 30 alcohol is wow. so hot in terms of the alcohol that it has to be blended with a really low hot alcohol and higher acid grape. And that's a story that will come later, the wine that that's gonna make. But by itself, I can't get it to work in like the really wet cool years, the really hot dry years, and if it, you know, if you can't make it work either end of the spectrum, right? It's kind of tough. So 
It's a really good component for Rosetta. Though. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. All right, ready for new and different? This is going to be very different. This is going to be different. He gave a preview of this one in the cellar. Look at it. Terra Anniversary. It's That's a mini bottle. Tiny little bottle. Yeah. All right. So this is Hoffmoth and has this beautiful revision on the label, see, of the Hawk Moth logo. Awesome. Okay. Because we love Sandy and her artwork here, she's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so this is a Petit Minsang based blend. So 75% Petit Minsang, I think 23 Chardonnay and 2% Chenin Blanc. And it decided it wanted to come out sweet. So I get asked all the time with native yeast, does everything finish dry? Every time, and I always say, yes, this time is no. <laughs> um, so I was trying to make a dry wine. It just stalled at this point and sat there until I made peace with it as being awesome like it is. And then we bottled it like that and it worked out great. So this is really cool because the wine decided how it was gonna be and it decided for the best. And I think you'll see that the balance in this is that had it had from a different vintage year a significantly higher acidity, it could have balanced with higher alcohol and come out as a nice um, refreshing table wine. But with the 2019 vintage year, as acids were a little bit lower, sugars were a little bit higher, this point came out really ideal and has that classic like Petit Minsang, you know, honey, tropical fruit, all those characteristics in it. Just sweet enough to put it in the little bottle. Not necessarily because it's super high in terms of percent sugar, it's around 3%, but because of how that sugar shows in relation to the acidity in it. Now, I'm not a sweet wine guy, but I think I can drink that whole little bottle. <laughs> Easily. It does have the sweetness to it, but it's not overwhelming or overpowering like a dessert wine would be. It's not, it's not that high sugar plus high fruit, but it's, it's got a sweetness that feels more like you're drinking a very natural juice with like no sugar added, if that makes sense. I mean, it's, yeah. I feel like when I've had sweet dessert wines in the past, it's like they added a scoop of domino sugar to the right. to the wine. Um, and this one, it, the sweetness is balanced with the fruit, and then you do get the tropical fruit in it. Um, but it is, it's very drinkable. It's not, oh, I have to wait for after dinner. This is something for the end of the night. This is something you can enjoy in the afternoon. But wouldn't you agree that this falls in the classic Artera, that it doesn't fit a common category that mm -hmm. no it's not sweet like an ice wine right. like syrup sweet right but also isn't that just a little touch sweet to be put in a regular bottle as a table <laughs> wine <laughs> that is the perfect bottle for it right you know so it is what it is it's really cool i like it so you said while you were making this one you were expecting it to be dry but then all of a sudden the yeast just stopped and had to come to peace with it and trust that the yeast had done what it was supposed to do. And you're one of a few here in Virginia that are doing all native yeast, natural fermentation, spontaneous fermentation. Is that part of why people shy away from it? There is a reputation that native yeast is very unpredictable. You never know what you're going to get inconsistent quality, significant losses, lots more problems, and all those things, while maybe true, are no more true than equal for conventional winemaking. Hmm. So it's learning a different system, and conventional wine has the same problems. They have stuck fermentations that don't go all the way through. Hmm. They have all these you know, burnt rubbers and reductive sulfur compound characteristics that my wines don't tend to have. Mine do start and finish fermentations typically slower, uh, so there is a higher risk of oxygen exposure and problems with that, whereas the commercial yeast fermentations are so fast that there's more problems with what you would think of as like anaerobic 
stress. So it's kind of like choosing which set of problems you're going to deal with and learning how to manage them. Uh, but most winemakers are t taught from the beginning to fear this process that we have embraced. This wine is one of those examples of, it is a wine that did what it was going to do. It might have been the same with a commercial yeast, might not. And it could have been the vintage year and the balance of the acid and the sugar in this. It could be some tendency within the varietal that we see so many petite and things made into the um, ice wine or late harvest styles or semi-sweet table wines. There could just be something within this grape that leans that way naturally. Hmm. I don't know, and I don't always have control. But that allowing the wine to decide for itself tends to result in the most ideal balance in each one of the wines. Okay, I would say that when we start a clip. We're going to go back and see, even though it hasn't been that long, um, if we're picking up any difference in the Rusa, maybe we will, maybe we won't. That's okay. Yeah. But I'm going to try and see, because <laughs> this one tends to evolve really quite nicely. I do get a difference. So as it warms, you get, to me, more of that cordial-ish kind of feel to it, that extra, richer, more viscous mm -hmm. character starts to come through uh, that I think a lot of people really appreciate the complexity of flavor characteristics that emerge with that breathing and that warming. And it's pretty cool because you can kind of choose how you like this one. You get it or not? <laughs> I definitely get the more, the more viscous or more, I guess they call it mouth feel. Yeah. to the wine as, um, as it's been open longer. There's, there's more happening, it, it opens, and it's, um, it's more present, I would say. You, get, you can really taste through the different flavors. I'm gonna check the Chardonnay too, because a lot of times this does the same thing. Let's see what happens. I definitely get in there too. There is the vintage year difference, but the flavors I think really open up their complexity, this like width rich um, depth of flavor characteristics mm -hmm. shows through. So I think that's really cool about those wines. Yeah, it's like a longer flavor profile almost. The first sip when it had just been opened, it went quick. This lasted longer. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thanks for taking the time to listen to this presentation if you have any questions there's a Facebook group created for discussion of our tarot wines you're welcome to post there and Sandy will hand me her phone and tell me to answer the questions so I'll be right on top of that and uh, you're always welcome if you don't want to be in that type of format to shoot me an email uh, call whatever you want to do happy to talk to any of you at any point in time and I want to thank Dan for coming out and getting out of the house and sharing wine and giving me somebody to talk to. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the preview. Yeah, really good to have you here. I'm excited about these. Hopefully you are That's too. Good. And uh, everybody, thanks. And uh, we'll hopefully see you soon.